Okay. Um, thank you, and, and thanks for the opportunity to um, share our uh, ongoing study um, uh, with you guys. This is a uh, great meeting, and I've enjoyed it. So, um, the uh, uh, and I'll try and um, comment. There's been a bunch of good discussion this morning. There's a few points that I'll try and uh, address directly as we're talking about <coughs> this. And one of them, uh, you know, one of the studies about the clinical trial design and who, who's actually in your trial. Uh, I think um, Julie might have uh, mentioned earlier that if you're doing things where it's uh, you've got a population that has readily access to come back to the to the clinic, get their you know if it's warfarin, getting their testing done every two three days, that may be a whole different population than if you're talking about an underserved population where uh, the the parents have to decide whether they're going to spend their three dollars to go back and get this some INR test done or whether they're going to use it to buy another box of cereal uh, so their kids can actually eat. And there's so I think one of the things that was the initial motivation here is that pharmacogenomics might be a little bit different if you're looking in a, in a different uh, study population. But the overarching sort of uh, question um, about why did we uh, run this study uh, is really um, trying to figure out how we can get uh, genomics, pharmacogenomics implemented. And in order for it really to be uh, implemented widely, number one, it has to have clinical value in a uh, practice setting. I think nobody will argue with that. But it also needs to be economically valuable uh, in such a setting, uh, in such that genetic testing really should only be widely implemented if it can be shown to be of high value medicine. But genetic testing will only be implemented widely if the pro if the providers uh, and quite frankly whoever's paying for it is properly incentivized. And so we. Um, thought that in really an economic analysis alongside the clinical studies will generate information uh, that will help for this to become uh, more widely adopted. This has um, involved then a variety of people that we, uh, quite frankly, weren't used to working with, um, including economists um, that really had to be involved uh, in some of the implementations and um, <coughs> addressing some of the questions we've talked about uh, before. So it's really a, a group effort of a variety of us from the School of Public Health, the uh, Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, Reagan Streif, and the, uh, the um, Clinical Pharmacology. So um, this, uh, uh, the study that um, uh, we uh, named it after having a couple of beers and a day or two to think about it, so uh, it was the uh, Indiana Genomics Implementation Opportunity for the Underserved. Uh, the acronym we use is Ingenious. Uh, that's where Mark's comment uh, came from. Uh, and this is funded, it's one of the six sites uh, funded by the NHGRI, uh, the Ignite Network. And the goal, or the, uh, what we're doing is testing the effect of prospective reactive pharmacogenetics genotyping on healthcare costs and adverse events. Um, and this, um, you know, as we were thinking about this, we debated, um, as we talked about, there's a variety of different type of trial designs you could, you could use. I think, um, you know, one of the comments was if we could figure out what the uh, trial is we need to do. I don't think there is the trial. I think it's we first have to decide exactly what question we want to ask and then figure out there will be different trial designs for each type of question. This is one we, we uh, set a line. Uh, the endpoints of the trial are total health care costs and adverse events. Um, and uh, it initially was uh, started in the Eskenazi, which is our uh, local county hospital. Um, but since then has uh, expanded out to the IU Health uh, patients, which is a uh, center, or which is a healthcare system of 18 hospitals across Indiana. And we are currently uh, in six of them, but uh, expanding by the week actually to additional ones. The design is that they're randomized to either get um, uh, one of 27 uh, different medications, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and either uh, when they get one of their, those scripts for the first time, uh, or at least not have gotten it in the last 13 months, uh, we get, uh, we randomize them to either genotype guided uh, or just standard of care, which they are not contacted at all. Um, uh, so we're, uh, and then we just follow their health care costs through their medical records. Um, and that, um, uh, so there's uh, pros and cons to all these different parts of the design, and uh, happy to, to discuss those either at the end or uh, in the discussion. These are, as probably most of you can guess, the logical uh, set of drugs uh, on there, uh, mostly ones from that have CPIC guidelines, and the corresponding <coughs> genes that are included on there are uh, also ones that, uh, you know, most people in the room would uh, suspect are the ones that are relevant from the CPIC guidelines. 
As we started the trial, we went through each one of these gene drug pairs, created a uh, little flow chart like this, and actually this one now needs to be updated to uh, exclude anybody under 12, I think, for coding. But uh, the principle here is we uh, had a, uh, um, basically a flow chart that we could use in our uh, adjudication committee when we got the genotype and the drugs to figure out what we were going to do so it was consistent uh, as the trial was going on. And so we have those, and they are uh, being deposited, if not already, into the uh, Spark toolbox. The, for any of the uh, genotyping gurus, um, if you're interested, there's 51 SNPs and 16 genes, uh, genotyping assays using the Quant Studio. Uh, using the open arrays, we have a separate assay for the copy number variations for 2D6. We chose this because it was accurate and flexible. I mean, some of the things that we initially thought we would have on here, some of the genes, uh, gene drug pairs we've actually taken out because things like hepatitis C uh, therapy has completely changed and people aren't using interferon anymore, so we're not, you know, that becomes irrelevant uh, even during the time of our trial. It is a CLIA approved and CAP certified uh, genotyping uh, platform. So um, you can't read this, I'll uh, show you in the next slide, <coughs> um, uh, I'll like, blow this uh, thing up a little bit, but just to, uh, to show, so the, the sort of the whole uh, workflow that this goes, and the one, um, uh, this, this one is for the IU Health, uh, uh, and this bottom one down here is for the Eskenazi, they're broadly similar, but there are some differences, um, I don't really have time to go through the details of the differences. Um, but I, um, some of you may be able to see this, but I'll just uh, walk through. Basically, uh, the sort of short version of it is when a, a patient gets written a, a prescription for one of our, uh, or for actually for, um, for one of the medications, uh, all the data from Cerner, in this case, gets transferred to the data warehouse, of which uh, every morning we get a report written that says, okay, here's all the patients yesterday that got one of these prescriptions and it was a prescription for the first time. Uh, it then uh, generates a report that has that, the patient's MRN number, name, phone number, uh, any other concurrent medications, uh, which then is downloaded to our ingenious team, takes the report, and does a few things to look to see if are they already, or is there duplicates in the report, or uh, have they already been uh, contacted? Um, and if not, then they get randomized to either the genotype guided or the standard of care uh, option. Uh, of which then uh, we have a series of, uh, uh, we call them ResNet research coordinators that actually start calling the patient to try and recruit them uh, into the study. Uh, if we fail to reach them within five days, they're just entered into REDCAP because that's our time limit, which we need to have them back to get their genotyping report done. Um, and the uh, um, uh, subjects that are reached, uh, we discuss with them and uh, go through a uh, online consent. So we've set up now um, uh, so everything can be done because we're expanding out into IUH, which is uh, statewide, so we have to do all this stuff remotely because we cannot have uh, a coordinator in every hospital and every clinic uh, across the state. So this is all done remotely, so that's why it's phone calls. We do the online consent, um, and then if the, once they consent and we get it back, then uh, we arrange with them, and we've arranged with the blood draw stations and a variety of the hospitals around the state so they can go to whichever hospital they were either seen in or whichever one is closest to them. Even if they were seen downtown, but they live in Muncie, they can go to, the, to Ball University. They don't have to come back to the same clinic that they were done. And then uh, based on that, uh, we have uh, the requisition for the blood draw is just faxed to the central uh, requisition uh, uh, resource so they can, when they get to the draw station, they say, uh, I'm Sally Smith, uh, and they pull down the rec, draw the blood, and send it off, and, uh, and that's it. And then uh, um, there's a couple of things to make sure that it gets done uh, on time. It then gets sent to the pharmacogenomics lab, uh, of which it gets uh, uh, sent in, and then the patients are uh, uh, given a, a check or a gift card, depending on which institution. Uh, and then uh, the um, results then uh, are, uh, once the genotyping results are done, it comes back to our adjudication committee, which consists of a physician and a fellow, which pulls all the medication data and the genotype data together looks at it, if there is a recommendation for a change in their therapy, uh, then the physician uh, sends an email or a note to the physician and says, you know, this patient's uh, on X drug and they got this genotype, we'd recommend that you change it. And then it's up to the provider to actually decide uh, what they want to do. So the status of it, <coughs> we've currently enrolled roughly 500 subjects in the genotyped arm and about 1,300 in the control, <coughs> in the control arm. Um, now with the expansion into IU Health, we are the gene enrolling about 20 to 30 patients a week in the genotype guided arm 
and 50 to 60 in the control arm. And that's when we've expanded to six hospitals. We've still got another uh, 10 or 12 more that we could uh, expand into. Um, and that is that. Uh, if you're uh, interested in what the, <coughs> what the drugs are, these are the number of patients that are uh, given each of the different trigger meds. Um, so tramadol was the number one. Uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, was pretty high. Uh, codeine was up there. Uh, and you know, a couple of the interesting things, oftentimes when we're talking about this, we'll uh, get reactions from people. It's like, well, nobody uses codeine anymore. It's a lousy drug. Nobody, you know, nobody uh, uses it. Well, it's out of ours, it was the third highest uh, drug. Same with amitriptyline. We often get, it's like, it's only over in Europe that they use an tricyclic antidepressants. Nobody uses that here. Uh, and you can see here, some of it's for sleep and pain and different things, but these are drugs that are commonly uh, used. Um, we, um, obviously, it's a prospective uh, clinical trial. We can't uh, look at or see if there's any results yet. One of the things that we have actually uh, looked at is the uh, percent of the patients that uh, have had actionable results that have had messages sent back to the providers. Uh, and here, as you can see in the red, um, the red bar, it was about a quarter of them had actions where uh, we sent some notification back to the physician and about 4% uh, of the, popul of the uh, patients, uh, the physician actually wanted a uh, consult, so they wanted to talk to uh, our physician or whoever was on the adjudication committee at that uh, particular time. This was with the first roughly 200 patients, um, but just uh, talking to the people doing the adjudication, I think this is holding up pretty uh, similar as uh, time goes on and we increase our uh, enrollment. So um, this has also <coughs> made possible um, uh, it's really uh, catalyzed an additional uh, effort that we've uh, got going, which is our uh, Indiana University Precision Genomics Oncology Clinic, uh, where we've actually started using the same genotyping platform uh, and scenario to actually uh, uh, genotype some of our cancer patients. And this clinic, it, it was started by Brian Schneider and Milan Radovich, which are patients with refractory cancers or tumors of unknown origin in which they get somatic tumor genomics uh, done, um, uh, sequencing done by either Nantomics, Foundation Medicine, or Paradigm. Uh, in as much as possible, we're using Nantomics because that gives us both whole genome sequence of both the tumor and the germline. Uh, and so we uh, um, have the, we get, we also collect blood and on most of them and get germline pharmacogenomics done by our uh, pharmacogenomics lab. That's the same one we use in our Ingenious trial. And uh, um, <clears throat> so as part of that, in addition to actually uh, doing our, uh, running our chip on it, we're actually working to uh, get it so we can extract the data from the whole sequencing uh, data so we don't have to actually run the chip again. And this relates to some of the earlier discussions um, where we're actually uh, working the, doing some of the informatics to try and pull out the pharmacogenetics data directly out of that, which could, I think, then be transferred into uh, um, uh, programs like FarmCat, um, and one of the ones we've done is, and published some of this on, is Cipper, it's called Cipperippi, which our uh, informatics guys um, figured out a way to actually get uh, pretty good 2D6 data out of whole genome sequencing, uh, and we're now validating that in this clinical situation because this is purely clinical whole genome sequencing data coming, and we've got our germline uh, uh, genotyping done with our chip and our uh, 2D6 copy number assay, so we can actually use data from two CLIA environments to actually validate that. Um, and then we're expanding that from just 2D6 onto many of the other uh, SIP genes. So then as we got, as I started doing this, it was like, okay, so I was going to show uh, to our tumor board um, the, uh, the genotyping reports, right? So rather than just give them a text file that says they're, you know, 2C19 star 2 and uh, star 6 and 7 and whatever they were, of which I was pretty certain the physicians or the providers would uh, not really know what to do with. So I started making a uh, uh, slide like this that would say, okay, how can I summarize uh, the genotype data so the physicians or the providers can actually look at it? And it sort of grew into from what was originally just going to be the genotype data, but then as we are uh, talking about earlier, you can't really just put the genotype data in because you have all the drug interaction stuff on there too, right? So you can, in the same way you can knock out 2D6 with a gene, you can knock it out and get a phenocopy with different drugs. Um, and so then I started putting it, looking at all their concurrent medications uh, and considering that 
and so on the top, oops, uh, you can see each of these are uh, the genes, and this slide gets shown right after the history of the patient in the tumor board. So we've got some of the main metabolizing enzymes up here. If, if they're wild type and they have no drug uh, interactions, they get the green smiley face. If they have, in this case, a uh, like an intermediate metabolizer, uh, they have a, a down, yellow down arrow with a little uh, DNA double helix on it. Uh, if they have an up arrow, it means they're in, it's induced or it's an ultra-rapid metabolizer. In this case, it's got a pill on, so that means it's a drug interaction uh, that's on there. So we started thinking, well, and really to include all this stuff, uh, as was mentioned several times, you really also need to include liver function and renal function. Uh, so we actually, uh, I pull that out of the uh, medical records. Um, and Dan, you'll be happy to see I have QTC on there uh, for uh, ones that have EKGs or that have uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, QT prolonging drugs uh, on there. We've got a couple additional SNPs that relate to the toxicities. And then it also became evident as we were talking that it was really underappreciated the drug interactions of proton pump inhibitors and a variety of uh, um, acid suppressing agents that can interact with drugs like the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, and so we also then added uh, the stomach pH. So if, there's, if they're on any sort of acid suppressing inhibitors, um, like PPIs or H2 blockers, we put that on. So this would be an indication of being on a, on an, on a proton pump inhibitor. So this, <clears throat> as we we're talking, it's you know trying to expect that the genotype itself, without considering all these other things, is going to be, uh, you know, completely trump all these other things is probably unreasonable, and it really needs to be considered in, in the context along with all these other uh, factors, uh, too. So now for every one of the patients, I actually go and create uh, this slide um, manually. I need to figure out a better way to do it because it takes a lot of time to do it manually. But um, this is really a you know, been catalyzed by the fact that we had the infrastructure set up to start doing the CLIA genotyping, which we then expanded into uh, uh, into the uh, uh, into a cancer clinic. And this is purely for clinical purposes uh, that we're using it there. Okay, and Teju has given my my, uh, my one minute sign, and this is the last slide. Really, um, I mean, there's too many people to put on here, it's, but this has really been initially catalyzed by the Ignite Network, um, and that's what's fun in uh, the study. It then expanded into the IU Health Precision Genomics Clinic uh, and a variety of different uh, funding agencies uh, or uh, funding sources that we've had. So with that, I would be happy to uh, answer any questions. Great. Thank you, uh, Todd. Again, we have time for maybe one or two very quick questions. And Manoli, if you want to uh, head up. Julie. So, um, Todd, um, on your slide with the actionable results, which I think was about 30 percent, so is that actionable results relative to the trigger drug or, yeah. okay, and, and you guys just published, Peter, is that number similar? Did you guys have a similar number for, so for a, even just for the trigger drug? Um, about 30% would have an actionable result. That's right. Of drugs they are actually taking, you mean. Right. That's right. Yeah. Well, so that, yeah, so it was like 25%. Uh, and that was for the, uh, the one. Sometimes they also start on multiple drugs at once, uh, right? So, you know, sometimes there can be that. And we're also, as these reports come back, if it's somebody who's already in the database, meaning they're already on the trial in the genotyped arm, we will then uh, obviously send a notification, you know, later on. But that was for the initial incident trigger med. Great, thank you. Uh, so next is uh, Manoli uh, Pereira from Northwestern University, Account, Discover, and Translation. 